Today, we're checking out Super Mario 64. You may have heard of it. Released in 1996 by Nintendo EAD, it was a launch title for the Nintendo 64 alongside other titles I've reviewed, such as Pilotwing 64, Wave Race 64, and Cruise in USA. In those reviews, I've always highlighted that in one way or another, the success of Super Mario 64 always outshined those games at launch, which I always felt seemed a bit unfair when you consider their level of quality. Well, all except for Cruise in USA, that game can jog right on. The fact is, I've never been a Nintendo kid. It was all about Ape Escape and Gran Turismo for me growing up, so you can guarantee that this review will be nostalgia free. Having said that though, gosh I'm impressed. Just about every retro reviewer and the Dreamcast enthusiast dog has looked into this game, so I always thought it was a bit fruitless to add an extra opinion. The curiosity got the best of me though, and since I've never played it before, I'm going to treat this game much like any other game I've reviewed on this channel. So let's check it out. Just in case you've lived a couple of decades like myself and also never played Super Mario 64, the story goes something like this. Mario, forever dating a royal princess even though he's a plumber, although having said that, being a plumber is a very noble profession and there is nothing wrong with that, is invited to her polygonal castle to eat some, uh, cake. Sexual undertones aside, cake is great. Rocking up seems like a great idea regardless, because at the very least, you'll still receive delicious delicious cake. This is a kids game though, so let's move on from analysing that. He arrives, and hey, what do you know it, she's been kidnapped by Bowser. Again, you'd think Bowser would be in total prison by now for so many repeated kidnappings since the 1980s, but what can you do besides from rescue her again? This is a 3D platforming game, that's what made it so mind blowing as it was more or less the first of its kind and linked to an established and well known series as well. Basing off a hub world, which is Princess Peach's abode, you can travel to numerous worlds by mostly jumping through paintings so you can find stars. The idea is that Bowser has nicked all these stars and thus controls the universe's power, or something like that. Getting these stars back will screw him over and the day will be saved by everyone's favourite hero who can also incidentally fix your toilet. Handy. These worlds are huge, and tons of different gameplay elements come into play for each one. The list is pretty bloody long and I won't be able to mention everything, but trust me when I state that this game will constantly surprise you. Just when you think you've done and seen everything, you'll go around a corner and be smacked in the face of cold hard game design. <laughs> I like that. There's all the basic platforming you'd expect, jumping, climbing, swimming, but then there is variations that would have been unanticipated at the time, like being able to backflip up higher, do long jumps, and jump off walls. Sure, all of these would have featured in other games separately at one point or another, but this single game crams them all in. What was once the main gameplay quirk is just another thing you can do in Super Mario 64 to get from points A to B, and I find that awesome. A lot of this is done just by the A button and the thumbstick too, with plenty also achieved by the Z and B buttons, but it's cool how they simplified most of it to a single button and the joystick. It's little quirks thrown in that will get you too, like if you fall off a platform, Mario may grab onto the edge if you fall the right way, or if his trademark hat gets knocked off, it won't respawn with him and you have to go back to where you lost it and track it down. It's now I can see why this game might have outshined other release titles. I always thought it was just because it was a Mario title, and doing well was a given for such a company specific series. Sure, games like Pilot Wing 64 were good and might have become more established and remembered if they were released later on, but Super Mario 64 is genuinely a groundbreaking game. As somewhat of an outsider, I now respect it as the fantastic title it is. It's not all rainbow roads and sunshine though, as obviously a few elements are going to fall through the gaps for such a humongous game. The main gripe that might slightly annoy you within minutes of playing is the in-game camera. There are two viewpoints that can be switched between as you play, which basically make the camera closer and further away. While the camera is the furthest away, you have full control of the camera and can rotate at 360 degrees. When it's closer up though, the game tries to help by auto-rotating. It does a terrible job of this, usually facing Mario as he moves, instead of being behind him so, you know, you can see where the hell you're going. It wouldn't be so bad if you had full control of the camera and then could constantly fight the direction it turns at least, but when the close up view is enabled, it only lets you rotate at about 180 degrees. This gets quite annoying as you play, certainly during boss fights when the view is actually blocked by the enemy you're trying to attack. That's the main problem though, with the gameplay only otherwise being slightly hampered by a kind of crappy turning radius of Mario himself and poor hit detection when you're trying to talk to characters or read signs. The B button is pushed to do that, which is also the attack button, so sometimes you end up punching the item or characters instead of interacting with them. I feel these are fairly small problems in such a big game however, and I won't let them stop you from playing. Although I should add that I didn't like the saving system too much as well, but then again I never do. Like all my graphs in that area, the problem likely lies with technical constraints. 
You can only save when you collect a star, so if you say, unlock a whole area but then turn the console off without collecting a star, you'll have to re-unlock that area every time until you do. Considering this game saves without a controller pack though, I'll forgive it. I can't imagine there is any flash memory built into this particular cartridge, meaning it's kept alive by a simple battery. Now, being a release title and developed by Nintendo and all, they would want this game to show off the capabilities of the N64 so they could sell more and rack in the fat stacks of cash. Pilo Wing 64 had the flight physics and vast maps, Wave Row 64 had the amazing looking water and also the aquatic physics to go with it, so what does Super Mario 64 bring to the table? Well, believe it or not, this game gets most of its fame from the fact that it's a fantastic and fun game to play. Crazy, I know, but I wouldn't lie to you, dear audience. Having said that though, the console's capabilities are shown off by the graphics and the huge maps, much like in Pilot Wing 64. Many modern reviewers seem to dig into the fact that the graphics aren't as amazing as they originally seemed 20 odd years ago, but I disagree. I've played a fair few N64 games in the modern day, and this holds up quite well graphically compared to what I've previously played. The graphics aren't muddy or blurred at all in my opinion, which is what most N64 games suffer from. The bright colour tones and cartoony graphics are just so nice on the eyeballs, and I think they did a fantastic job. There is just so much detail crammed in, and the amount of characters and environments included are so plentiful that a whole video could probably be made listing them. I would never play a game just for its graphics, but this title is sure worth a looking at. The sound design is nothing short of fantastic too, to coincide with the fantastic visuals. This game is just overall a friendly assault on the senses really. The tunes will stick in your head, and the sound effects are nothing short of distinctive when compared to gaming overall. I don't really know how I can articulately explain how great it all sounds, but trust me, there are not too many other games on this level. I've heard all the music in this game from external sources, and I've never even played the damn thing before. If that doesn't explain how important and known they are, then I don't know what will. So there you have it, Retro Game On's take on possibly the most talked about game on the internet. There wasn't really much reason for me to make this video at all really, but I hope it's shown that the quality of this game in the present day isn't held up by nostalgia alone. 11 million copies were originally sold, and I highly recommend you find one for your collection if you're into platformers, even if you're not into Nintendo franchises. Otherwise, this game was remastered for the Nintendo DS, and has also been available on the virtual console since about 2006, so you can also play it on your 3DS, as well as the Wii's too. Hello Retro Gamers and thank you so much for watching. The question of the day is, what's the big game that you've never played, and if possible, why? For me, it's been a lot of Nintendo franchises. I'm gradually getting to them thanks to this channel and this hobby, but I basically only had a PS1 growing up so much of my playtime was on that. Anyway, there are a few different things to check out on this screen while you're still here. For one, I've updated my blog about some new hardware I use for this channel, which is quite exciting since I was supposed to be a poor student. Otherwise, there has been a new retro gaming forum launched. You may have seen my previous video about this, but Retro Oz has just been launched and they actually gave me my own sub forum, so I think that's pretty cool. Links to that are in the description along with my Twitter and Facebook pages, but yeah, I'll stop talking now. Have a fantastic day, and I'll catch you next time.